So in today's lesson, we'll be looking at the internment of Japanese Canadians during World War II. Now, after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and attacked Hong Kong in December 1941, Canada was at war with the Japanese. The Mackenzie King government, under the War Measures Act, took a drastic measure to round up 22,000 Japanese Canadians and intern them in camps for fear that some of them were enemies of Canada. In this lesson, we'll look at the background and consequences of Japanese internment. And we'll do this by splitting the lesson into four main parts. We'll start by looking at life for Japanese Canadians before World War II. Then we'll look at some of the reactions to Pearl Harbor in Canada. Then we'll look at the actual internment of Japanese Canadians. And finally, we'll look at the aftermath of internment. Now, the Japanese faced many problems uh, in the lead up to their internment. They faced xenophobia, racism, and discrimination because many were not willing to assimilate. And so this took a variety of forms. There were laws that prevented them from entering some professions. They were denied the right to vote. They were only eligible for some types of social assistance. Forestry and fishing permits were denied. And the goal of all of this, in many cases, was to try to force Japanese to go back to Japan, to make them feel unwelcome. And again, this took a variety of forms. So some of these were official government policies, but there's also sort of uh, this informal casual racism that discriminates against people. Now, many Japanese Canadians made efforts to fit into their new home. So we could see things like here in this picture on the left, where many Japanese women would adopt Western fashion. Or on the right side, you had Japanese trying to integrate into the economies of their new homes. So we have here a Japanese-owned grocery store. In another case here, we have a chef uh, in their family on the left side picture, and then the staff of a Japanese language newspaper. Um, now, perhaps significantly, it was called the Canada Times and still published today. Um, but we can kind of see here, even though it's a Japanese language paper, just by looking at the title of their publication, they're aimed to fit in, calling it the Canada Times. So even though it's a Japanese language paper that would circulate in the community to sort of update them on what's going on with um, their community, um, calling it the Canada Times to reinforce, you know, that this is their home. Now, the Japanese had been immigrating to Canada for decades by the time World War II broke out. Most settled on the West Coast, especially in British Columbia, where we saw a high concentration of Japanese immigrants. However, they also faced many challenges and forms of discrimination. So discrimination is making a difference or distinction in order to treat someone favorably or unfavorably. Now, we saw this with Japanese Canadians in a variety of ways. Japanese Canadians did not have the right to vote until 1948, and they could not be teachers or civil servants, so they could not work in government jobs. They were also not permitted to join the armed forces in most cases. And then we saw incidents like in 1907 where there were race riots in the little Tokyo area of Vancouver, where 5,000 racist Canadians marched into the area, smashing the windows of homes and stores. And we can see the evidence of this on the right side here in this picture. And one of the reasons why the Japanese were such easy targets is because they were a visible minority, meaning just by looking at them, you could tell that they were different than the majority. So this made them easy targets, and it was easy for people to, um, to direct their racism at these groups of people. And here we can see some accounts of what that felt like for Japanese Canadians. This first quote here says, I remember when we were kids, there were some restaurants we couldn't get into. The man at the soup pot waved a big spoon at us and yelled, Stay out of here, you Japs. And some of the theaters downtown, they made you sit in, up in the heavens, up in the back gallery, or over to the sides. And another account, They just did not like Japs. Small, cunning, money mad greedy, always trying to do the white man in, gotta watch him, else he'll get you, can't be trusted, still loyal to the emperor, still loves Japan, sends his kids to Japanese language school, is a Buddhist. They were different, therefore inferior, and they should be exploited. How wasn't this Canada, a white country? So we can see here in both of these quotes, Japanese Canadians being made to be the other. Um, we're seeing the differences with them being exaggerated 
and the sort of aspects of their culture being denigrated in these quotes. And so for people who were of Japanese descent, you could see sort of this um, stigma of being Japanese being directed to you in a variety of ways, and what you could do and in the way people treated you. And we all, beyond that, we also had official forms of government racism at the time. So in 1928, there was something called the Gentleman's Agreement. This is where Prime Minister Mackenzie King suggested limiting the number of Japanese immigrants to control their population growth, which would lessen the risk of future riots. So they, this was limited to 150 Japanese who were allowed to enter Canada each year. And Japan agreed with this limitation. So it was a limit on the amount of immigration that uh, Japan would send to Canada. However, despite being faced with racism and discrimination in various parts of their lives, many Japanese endured these hardships and made the most of their life in their new home. So here we can see some obvious signs of loyalty to the state. Um, so these are pictures from the U.S. On the left side here, we have a Japanese grocery store with an I am American sign on the outside. Again, showing that they're proud to be in their new home. And then on the right side, we have Japanese students saying the Pledge of Allegiance. The same thing we saw in Canada here. So in Canada, we have here's a parade with uh, Japanese women and girls dressed in their traditional kimonos welcoming the royal family to Canada. So again, Japanese Canadians are going out of their way to try to fit in with uh, other Canadians and show that they're proud to live here. Despite trying to build up this goodwill, Pearl Harbor happens and changes all of this. So remember, 1941, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, which is the great American naval base. And the surprise attack destroyed 12 American warships and 188 planes, killed uh, over 2,400 soldiers and 68 civilians. So this was a surprise attack, um, trying to get keep America out of the war. Of course, though, it brings America into the war. So the U.S. declares war on Japan. And Canadians feared that Canada was going to be next. If this could happen to the U.S., the fear was this could happen to Canada too. We have big cities on our west coast, like Vancouver, that might be targets for this type of attack. So in response, racism towards Japanese Canadians escalated. And so we can see this racism pop up in a variety of ways. So by looking at these propaganda posters here, we can see some of the ways in which Canadians were viewing the Japanese at the time. We can see these stereotypes and racist cartoons that depicted the Japanese as being a threat to Canadians. Here we have depictions of the Japanese as snakes and rats, so literally dehumanizing them, literally drawing them to be animals. This is a cartoon that would have appeared in newspapers in Canada at the time that depicts the Japanese again as a snake, and it's a warning from the man from British Columbia on the left warning the rest of Canada um, that not to be weak and to treat the Japanese uh, as a threat and to be harsh to them. So we can see the right side here. You have the man from Eastern Canada with his uh, daughter, and they're you know looking at the snake in the jail cell maybe having pity, maybe thinking they shouldn't be treating them this way, but you have the man from British Columbia saying, be careful, mister. The idea being, you know, don't turn your back, don't let them out, or else they're going to attack you. Here we have propaganda depicting the Japanese as ruthless, willing to kill the weak. And all of this propaganda makes people think less of the Japanese. So dehumanizing them makes it easier to discriminate against your neighbors. If you think of them as less than human, it's easier to be mean than them. It's easier to treat them like animals. And to be complicit with state-sponsored racism. And so as a result, racism becomes a part of everyday life for Canadians. So we can see here... Someone on top of their home or their business has a sign here that says, Japs keep moving. This is a white man's neighborhood. So we can see this growing resentment towards the Japanese. And this leads to the government deciding that the best course of action was to intern Japanese Canadians. So the paranoia set in after Pearl Harbor, and the people of BC wanted to feel safe again. 
So Mackenzie King wanted to have their votes in the next election. He was more than happy to oblige. The Canadian government had already enacted the War Measures Act with the outbreak of the war, which, remember, gives the government a lot of power to take away people's rights and civil liberties and suspend a lot of those rights that people have to protect them from the government um, going after them without cause. This meant that Japanese Canadian non-citizens had no rights and could not legally refuse to obey. Japanese citizens were treated as enemy aliens and had no rights as a result. And over a period of nine months, 22,000 people were taken from their homes and scattered throughout BC. 75% of them were born in Canada. So these people, most of them are born in Canada. They've, their parents might have immigrated here. Their grandparents, in some cases, might have immigrant here, immigrated here. Um, in some cases, these were third-generation Canadians, and they were still being sent off to these internment camps for fear that they were enemies of the state. And they were given the option of being deported to Japan or being relocated east of the Rocky Mountains, out of British Columbia. Most choose the, chose the latter because Japan was a foreign country to them. Again, the majority of them were not born in Japan, or perhaps had never even traveled there. And with just a day's warning, many Japanese Canadians living on the coast of British Columbia were told they had to leave their homes. They were told they could only take one suitcase. And here we have a transcript of the instructions that the Japanese were given. And as you can see by reading this, they're very strict. There's uh, limits on what they can bring with them, the types of items they can bring, as well as the amount that they can bring with them. And what this meant was that they had to leave most of their belongings behind. So if they weren't able to take a lot of what they had with them, they had to leave things behind, and there's sort of no guarantee that it's going to be there when they get back, if they ever get back. Now, one of the reasons that internment was justified at the time was the fear that Japan might try to hide spies in the general population. They might send spies over to blend in with the Japanese Canadian population, who would then report back to Japan um, with information about Canada and their war preparations. So here we have a fisherman being questioned by the RCMP, and fishermen in particular were targeted by the RCMP. There was a fear that they could use their boats to communicate with Japanese naval ships out at sea. Um, there's no evidence that this actually happened, but we can see this paranoia that set in at the time, this fear of the Japanese, and in many cases it was an irrational fear. Another condition of internment was that their possessions were confiscated and sold by the government. Japanese Canadians were ordered to turn over all of their possessions to the custodian of enemy alien property. Businesses, fishing vessels, homes, and personal items were all auctioned off at low prices. The profits were used to pay off fees and for the cost of their own internment. Now, once they packed up, families were forced to move to the internment camps. At the internment camps, families were often separated. Women and children were sent to shanty towns in the interior of BC. Many of the children had been born in Canada and had never been to Japan, didn't speak Japanese. So we, again, we have to question, were they really a threat? Was this a rational reaction to the war? Here we can see some images of people getting ready to board buses to head off to the internment camps. Here we can see children who have been uh, given ID tags who are being waited to be relocated. Here we have a Japanese Canadian family being relocated to a camp in the interior. Again, we can see this is a mother and their children. Their father's nowhere to be seen. Um, it could be that they weren't here for this picture. Or it could be that they were sent off somewhere else and they've been separated from the father. And here we have a picture of what that internment camp might have looked like. You can see it almost looks like a prison in a sense. And for many Japanese Canadians, that's what it would have felt like being sent off to prison. And when they get there, there isn't a whole lot waiting for them. Now, the living conditions in the camps were cramped. 
this is what a typical room would have looked like for someone sleeping here. And you can see they have to keep all their possessions with them. They have a bed and all their clothes are hanging up above them. And that's the only space you get. There was very little privacy and almost no modern amenities. So uh, a Japanese Canadian described the conditions as follows. The walls of her shack were one layer thin, wooden board covered with two-ply paper, sandwiching a flimsy layer of tar. There was no ceiling below the roof. In the winter, moisture condensed on the inside of the cold walls and turned to ice. So life in the camps was harsh for people. Uh, Slocan, the largest of the camps, which had about 5,000 people in it, did not even have houses, and the Japanese had to live in tents throughout their first winter. And we can see here what that would look like. And again, this is in the interior of BC. It gets very cold in the winter. So dealing with that would have been a challenge for many people. At Hastings Park in downtown Vancouver, women slept in a livestock building where ventilation was inadequate. So they took a, an agricultural building that was there and they transformed it into a living quarters for Japanese Canadians as a temporary solution. And privacy was non-existent. So when you're going to the, again, you might have had open washrooms without a whole lot of privacy um, in terms of sleeping areas. We can see on this picture on the right here where there's just dozens of beds in a giant room where everyone's sleeping together. So very little privacy. Families are all sleeping in the same room. And food was unappetizing and outbreaks of diarrhea and other uh, foodborne ailments were common as a result. Here we can see what people did during the day. So on the left side, we have children gathering potato crops, and on the right, gathering scrap iron. Here we have families eating in the mess hall. And here's another shot of a mess hall. Again, another shot, um, you might notice that there aren't many men in these pictures, um, mostly women and children. Again, men were sent to work on roads and other infrastructure projects. They were separated from their families. Some were given the option to rejoin with their families and work on sugar beet farms when there was a shortage of labor. Um, but again, it's very difficult for families to stick together. Now, for those who resisted, there was a special camp for them called Angler in Ontario. This is where those who resisted internment were sent, and they were treated as prisoners of war. And in this picture here, we can see on their backs, they're wearing a giant red circle. Um, and so this was to provide an easy target in case anyone tried to escape. So again, anyone who tries to resist, they're treated as prisoners of war. And they're, again, just another way that they're being uh, dehumanized. Now, when the war was over, the interned were allowed to return home. However, what they returned to was empty houses, or in the case of this photo, a vandalized house. And again, all, most of their possessions would have been confiscated and sold off. So they're coming home to pretty much an empty house. Now, today, the internment of Japanese Canadians is seen as one of the most shameful moments in our history. And it is seen that way with good reason. We took away people's basic human rights and dignity for racist reasons, for irrational reasons. 22,000 Japanese were interned, and there's no evidence that we interned any spots, Japanese spots. Um, so this is a lot of hardship that we put on people for really not a whole lot of good reason. And it's unacceptable. So as the years went on, many fought for the Canadian government to make amends. And in 1988, the government tried to do so. So Prime Minister Brian Mulroney announced the Canadian government's formal apology for the wrongful incarceration, seizure of property, and the disenfranchisement of thousands of Canadians of Japanese ancestry. And on September 22, 1988, he signed the Redress Agreement, which provided $21,000 for each individual directly wronged. So in this lesson, you learned, before World War II, many Japanese Canadians faced various forms of racism in their lives. 22,000 Japanese Canadians were interned by the government after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Families lost their possessions and were forcibly relocated to internment camps, mostly in the BC interior. And in 1988, the government of Canada formally apologized for its actions and paid out reparations to the affected families.